not only because it's the middle of summer and the sun is shining, maybe a little too bright, because come on now, the way, the way that he's heat wave is set up, okay? But also, I used to, when I was growing up, I had a guidance counselor. She used to always tell me, Floyd, create your own sunshine. Create your own sunshine. I don't know about you. Even though the sun is shining outside, I know that there are so many different things that can try to bring you down, try to stop you from your mission, try to stop you from your purpose, try to stop you from where you are going. But baby, today I'm letting you know that you have the power to create your own sunshine, okay? Shine over your people. Shine over your team. Shine over your mission. Shine over your community. And y'all, I'm hoping that today we can bring you a little sunshine and you can shine along your board, okay? Come on. Want somebody if you don't know who i am oh i saw a show from alicia key she said you don't know my name but i hope you know my name y'all i am floyd jones i am the host that gives you the most i am calling from harlem today I love working with small organizations. I love working with the grassroots organizations and community builders. And y'all, my fun fact is that I'm trying to keep cool in this heat wave, okay? It is a little too hot. I don't know about you. I was talking to our guest, Sabrina, yesterday. She said that the power was out. Could you imagine having power outage in the middle of this summer heat? I don't, I don't know, but y'all, she still came on this call for y'all, okay? I love that. Y'all, that is bringing me joy. The recording of the slides are going to be emailed to you. You already know the deal. Use that Q&A. We're going to go deep today, okay? We are going to go deep today. We're going to learn a little bit more about board development and how to get your board to give. Comment. You know how it goes. Chat with me in that chat. Um, we're going to do our welcome and introductions. We have a few announcements, y'all. I'm super excited. And so you guys can hear the updates. We're going to dive all the way deep with Sabrina. We're going to do some Q&A, and then we're going to wrap things up. If you don't know who we are, we are Give Butter, your all-in-one fundraising solution. Everything that you need for donation forms, buttons, fundraising pages, events, auctions, integrations, so much, y'all. We got pledges that we're, that are in the pipeline. We got a mobile app, okay? That means you can take us on the go. Next time someone says, oh, I don't have, I don't have any cash, that's fine. We take card. We take Venmo, we take DAF, we, we got it all. Ain't no more excuses, y'all. We're going to fund this mission in 2024, okay? But y'all, we are give but our everything that you need, and it's all for free. Free is for me, okay? I don't know about y'all, but free is for me, y'all. And we are just recently rated the number one giving platform on G2. So if you don't believe me, ask your friends, okay? Um... Before we dive into some updates, I am so excited to announce that Give Butter Gives Back for Black Philanthropy Month is back, y'all. And we'll be giving away $10,000 to Black-led organizations throughout the month of August. We're going to start the campaign in August, but I just want to give y'all a little sneak peek, okay? Give y'all a little sneak peek so you can get y'all campaigns ready and you can spread the word. I don't know if y'all know the news, but Black-led organizations are historically underfunded. And so Give Butter is doing all that they can along with other organizations to turn that tide. So if you apply, if you're um, uh, eligible for that, definitely apply and get involved. But y'all, I am so excited because I get to bring out one of my favorite people, okay? One of my favorite people, and that is Claudia. Can y'all help me welcome Claudia? Claudia, how are you doing today? Floyd, I love when you sing my name. It's just like music to my ears. <laughs> uh, how is everything? How are you? What is new at Give Butter? Let's let's get into it. Talk to me. What what are some things that are new at Give Butter? Everyone, it is so nice to see you. I see a couple of familiar names in the chat. It's always a pleasure, never a chore. I am here to bring you some of Give Butter's latest coming updates. Uh, so you get these little toasty tidbits only by joining the webinar. Ooh, so toasty tidbits, come on now. Tidbits. Uh, so we're super excited to introduce Give Butter's upcoming mailings feature. So Ooh. I know a couple of you may think direct mail, who does that anymore? You'd be surprised the younger generation, the Zillennials, Gen Z, whatever you want to call them, actually love tangible pieces of mail. It feels special to them. It reminds them how important they are to your organization. So now with Give Butter, you can experience this uh, impact of direct mail without the delay. We are going to help you effortlessly segment your audience. We're going to help you craft those custom donation letters, and you can let Give Butter handle the rest for you. You don't have to worry about printing. You don't have to worry 
worry about stamping. You don't have to worry about sending those letters because with Give Butter, we're going to pick up all of that heavy lifting for you and we'll actually help you track your delivery and review those donations earned from that direct mail right from your dashboard. So goodbye, manual mailing. It is a thing of the past. We've absolutely got you covered there. How does that sound, Floyd? That is butterly delicious. I want to see, somebody already said it, but who does, who still does direct mail? Eileen does direct mail. I have, I get, um, I get mail from some of the organizations that I donate to and I love it. They make it personalized. They put my name in it. They actually write me out what's going on. Okay, come on. Aaron does direct mail. Laura does direct mail. Karen does direct mail. All the direct mail. So y'all, we're about to take the direct mail game to the next level. And you know what? It's all from your friends at Give Butter. Come on. What else we, what else we got, Claudia? Heck yes. Now you can also get ready for pledged donation management. That's smooth as what butter? What did you Floyd? You already know. <laughs> Smooth as butter. So soon enough, you all can use Give Butter to actually log, track, and fulfill pledges seamlessly. We want to make it easy for you. Plus, on the bright side, you can send those reminders to your supporters about the gifts that they were excited to contribute. So you'll mm. never miss out on a promised donation ever again. Mm. Uh, of course, donors are going to have that range of payment options to choose from. Like Floyd said, you can tell them we can take card, we can take cash, we can take check. And more recently, we're also going to have the ability for you to acknowledge in-kind, stock, property, and other forms of donation type. Come on now. Every every type of gift. I love that. And y'all, this is so important. No more IOUs. No more uh, I'm good for it and I'm checking on me in a couple of No, no, no. You can now invoice in the platform too. Isn't that right? So pledge can come and you can invoice, send it out and make sure that that donation gets that the donation comes. Somebody said, is pay by check considered a pledge? I don't think so. I think you can, we also can acknowledge a check in the platform, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So we got everything for you. Thank you, Claudia. Keep, let's keep it going. What else, what else we got? I, we kind of just spread the, the, the tea yeah. a little bit. Boy, teamwork makes the dream work. I Listen. love it. Coming soon, you're also going to have the ability to easily uh, have this invoice experience for all of your Give Butter uh, donors here. So this option is going to allow you to send easy payment links so that your supporters can choose their favorite payment method. Like Floyd said, you have PayPal, you have Venmo, DAF donations to ensure that any outstanding pledge payments or perhaps sponsorships, matching funds are fulfilled with just a click of a button and you can mm. review and manage all of that information right from your GiveButter dashboard. Mm. We at the GiveButter team like to think of GiveButter as being the long haul CRM, the long haul fundraising platform and marketing tool for your organization. So we always are thinking of new ways to make this an easy and enjoyable experience for you. I love that. Y'all, no more one and done. Give Butter is a one-stop shop. So you can do everything in-house. And then guess what? When it's all under one roof, you can take your organization to the next level. And that is what we are all about here at Give Butter. I absolutely love it. Y'all, can we give a round of applause to our good friend, uh, Claudia? We are so grateful for you, Claudia. Thank you for everything and giving us these toasty tips, okay? That's a segment. Come on now. Toasty tips go. by Claudia. I love it. Yes, Thanks, friend. All right, y'all. So I want to see. I have a quick little poll we're going we gonna to launch, okay? who Y'all y'all ready for a little poll? Y'all ready for a little poll? I want to know in the chat, how long has your organization been, had a board of directors, okay? Let's go ahead and launch this poll. How long has your organization had a board of directors? My, it's just me and my cousin. We, we just hanging out, okay? Me and my cousin and my sister friend. Uh, we're just getting started. And y'all, for these next ones, I want to know, you know, has your organization, has your board been with you the entire time? Has your board uh, uh, really been uh, with you in the in since the infancy? Over 10 years, over one year? I want to see it in the chat. Let's see where we're at. Okay, come on now. All right, I'm going to end the poll. Oh my God, a lot of y'all said over 10 years. I love that. I might have to come up and call all y'all on this uh, uh, on this poll and, and y'all can let me know on this, on this chat and on this call how things are going because we want to hear longevity is the key. 
Longevity is the key, but y'all, we don't want to just have longevity. We want to have a board that also adds to our longevity. We don't want to just have placeholders. We want people who are going to actually add value. And my hope is that today with Sabrina, you're going to be able to understand and learn more about that. And you know, I'm going to stop yapping. I'm going to go ahead and bring my good friend up, y'all. Sabrina is from Edinburgh, Texas. She is the president and CEO of Supporting World Hope. And y'all, if you don't know her name, her name is Supporting. Her name is Sabrina Walker Hernandez. So come on with the initials and the acronyms. I love it. Fun fact, she has five grandchildren and they call her BB. But y'all, y'all are about to get to the best uh, from BB, okay? I want to add a pin. Sabrina, hello. Hi, Floor. Elizabeth used to live in Edinburgh. No one ever heard of Edinburgh, Texas. So I love that. <laughs> that is awesome that Elizabeth lived in Edinburgh. Put on 956. That's right. I oh my love God. That. Floor, we're connecting I love Elizabeth oh, and I. Melanie said, I worked in Edinburgh. Oh, Melanie. Melanie. I love it. I love it. I love it. Okay, Sabrina, before we jump in, talk to me. How are things going? How are you seeing the state of board development right now in our in our space? Well, I see the state of board development in this way. Look, I think that we have to learn how to build relationships with our board. I talk to a lot of CEOs and of large organizations, and they're just like, I just need my board to stay out of my way. Mm. <laughs> like, <laughs> they don't do nothing. I need them to stay out of my way. And I'm mm. like, oh, let's look at it a little bit different. They're your mm. team members. And sometimes uh, it's great that we have organizations up here that have been around for hundreds and I won't say thousands of years, but I just said out loud, but hundreds of years, because the organization that I ran was um, a Brown for 50 plus years. And we had the same CEO for 30 years. And then I was there for 20 years. And sometimes we get stagnant, mm. right? And we just continue to do things the way we always done them. And mm. so moving forward, I really want people to look at boards as um, a part of their team, you're building yes. a team. If you're going to the Super Bowl, you need a great team around you. You just can't say, "Okay, team, y'all sit over there, and I, I'll go ahead and get this." You got, you got to. That's the fastest everybody. way to burn out. That's the fastest, fastest way, to way to burn out. And you yes. already know me. I always say, if you want to go fast, go by yourself. But if you want to go far, you go together, y'all. And I yes. love it because a board is a central part of your community. So. Y'all, I'm going to let Sabrina take it from here. Go ahead and share your screen. Okay, now, y'all know I, the tech gods, I, I'm, I'm going to do this and wish me luck, okay? So I'm sharing and I got slideshow. Does everybody see it? We good? If I can get a verbal confirmation, that would be great. We good, Sabrina. All we right, good. thank you, Floyd. Okay. So we're going to be talking about making money moves, motivating your board members to give. And so a little bit about me. Y'all know I'm from Edinburgh, Texas, Who put on 956, but I studied political science and public administration. I obtained a nonprofit uh, management certification from Harvard Business School, and I'm a certified consulting coach, facilitator, and best-selling author who uh, helps nonprofits and small businesses really build relationships that increase revenue, particularly working with boards of directors. There is something to be said for building these relationships with your board of directors so that you can increase your money. Now, I, I start my trainings off with this particular flyer because look, this is me stepping outside of my comfort zone, right? So that is me skydiving over South Padre Island. Scaling Chase Tower in McAllen. Since I have some people who know where Edinburgh is, they know that size of that building in McAllen. That's me swimming with the dolphins. Look, all of this was outside of my comfort zone, but I forced myself to do it because there's great learning outside of the comfort zone. So some of the things that I may share with you today may push you outside of your comfort zone. But remember, there's great learning outside of the comfort zone, and you'll have some great experiences. So I'm going to ask you to really embrace what I'm saying, look at it from a different perspective, and get outside of the comfort zone. And so the goal of this presentation today is really so you can understand the role the board plays in resource development and fundraising, learn how to engage the board 
in each of those roles, and then know how staff can support the board in resource development and fundraising. And so the role of board members. So there are some individual roles that each board members um, take on, and that is give generously. So yes, I am, I am a true believer in your board members should be giving generously to your organization, be an advocate, and they need to participate in resource development and fundraising. Look, a board as a collective has three things, trustee, trusteeship, oversight, and ensure necessary resources. That's their role. So as an individual, the role is to give generously, be an advocate, and participate in resource development and fundraising. And when I say give generously, I truly mean give generously, make their own personal gift, because it's hard to ask someone else to do something you're not willing to do. It shows commitment and would make them a much better fundraiser. Now, I always get a little pushback on this. Um, some people say, well, they're giving their time and they're giving their talent. Um, why do why do I have to give my treasure to? Here's the thing. If you want to be a board member of an organization, the highest member of the family, the highest governing, it's time, it's talent, and it's treasure. It's those three things. If you don't want to give any of those three collectively, then you would make a great committee member, not on the governing board, not, not the top family member of the organization. So that's the conversation that I have. And it's a much easier conversation to have that and to facilitate board giving if you start in the recruitment process. So it is disingenuous for us to have to talk to people to join our board and we don't talk about fundraising. I've met with a lot of CEOs and a lot of people to say, well, we don't want to talk about fundraising because we don't want to scare them off. And I'm like, well, isn't that the point, right? If you get, you don't want someone who's not willing to fundraise for your organization. And you need to be clear about that responsibility. So talk about fundraising in the recruitment process. Now, there is a way that you talk about fundraising. And we're going to get into that because a lot of people think when you talk about fundraising, their mind immediately goes to asking for money. And that is not what fundraising is. And so, yes, you need to be very clear about how you talk about fundraising. And not only that, you need to be able to give people a fundraising pathway when you're talking about fundraising in the recruitment conversation. So I didn't say this, but let me share. I serve on five boards, guys. Five currently, right now, I serve on five boards of directors. I serve on two fundraising boards and three boards where I get to give out money. So I, I like all of those boards, but I like giving out money uh, a lot. Um, so when I interviewed for an organization that has been around for over 60 years in my community, they gave a clear fundraising pathway. They said each board member is responsible for raising $3,000. And this is how you get to your $3,000. First, we require that each board member join our Heritage Society. So our Heritage Society, the levels of giving is $1,500, 2005, 5,000, and 10,000. So you can join the Heritage Society. Every board member is required to join the Heritage Society. So as I'm listening to this, I'm like, okay, I know where I'm at. So I'm at 1,005, right? So, okay, can I give 1,005? Yes, I can give 1,005. And then they said the other 1,005 is each board member has to sell a table for our event called Fandango. So it's like, Yes, do I have a network to sell one table at 1,005? Yes, I do. So yes, that question that was part of the interview, and I was like, yes, I can do that. Yes, I can do that. And so they gave me a clear pathway. What we tend to do sometimes is 
First of all, we don't talk about fundraising during the recruitment process. And then we get them to the first meeting. And what do we talk about? We talk about fundraising. That's why I say that is um, disingenuous. But if we do talk about fundraising during the interview process, we don't give them a clear pathway. We just say that we ask every board member to fundraise $3,000 and you keep it moving. And you don't give that clear pathway. So, I just want to jump in really quick because, y'all, this is some gold that Sabrina is spitting in the first few minutes of this session. One thing that is really, really, really important to talk about is that this is now requiring a change in uh, your mindset, right? One thing that I used to always do when I was recruiting new board members, was we would also lay it out on a piece of paper. So I was like, listen, I want this to be very clear. I want you to know what I'm thinking. I want to know what I'm thinking. I want to have a clear plan in place. So then that way, halfway through the year, people ain't shuffling around and talking about, oh, well, uh, you know, I'm good for it. And, and you know, the way the economy is set up. No, 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 no. You're stepping in because guess what? You wouldn't enter a real partnership or a relationship with a friend or with, with a partner without you guys having a clear understanding of what? Your values. So this is not to hang someone on a cross or say, okay, you got to do X, Y, Z thing. It's because, hey, these are what we value at this organization. This is what we are trying to accomplish as an organization. And now I want you to be a partner with me so we can get to this goal together. And so now you have to start to change your mindset. That's why it's so important. Who is the person who is leading your board? Make sure that they are partnered with you as well and that you guys are on the same page and that way you can make a plan together. So then that way you don't feel like you're doing it by yourself or you're a fish out of water, okay? This is just okay. good, good stuff and I want to echo come on now <laughs> perfect perfect so that goes into that annual commitment form that that florida's talking about you know what do you have it written down and not only do you have it written down here's the thing we think just because we have it written down that we don't have to revisit it you gotta revisit it you gotta have a accountability process right so with my board and i saw someone in there say we have a board of 19 Okay, my board, I had a board of 21. The museum board that I serves on has 27 people. So you have to have an accountability process. And that accountability process for my board, and we did a point system. Hey, we gamified this thing. We made it fun. So for every $1,000 you um, gave or got, you got a point. For every board meeting you attended, you got a point. For every committee chair you attended, you got five points. We gamified it. And at the end of the year, the goal was to have every board member have at least 15 points. And we celebrated those who reached that. We had a banquet. We thanked them. We had a board member of the year. Um, we recognized them for perfect attendance. We went all out for our board members because they said yes. They're busy people, but they said yes. They said yes to giving up time with their family. They said um, yes to coming in and serving in the community. They said yes, so we honor that yes. And we don't say, you know what, just stay out of my way and let me do what I need to do. That's not the approach that I'm talking about. And the other thing to facilitate board giving is yearly individual meetings with board members. I met with my board outside of the board meeting. I went, met with my board chair, as Flora said, you need to have a good relationship with that board chair monthly. I shared the good, the bad, the ugly. We had a relationship. Everybody got to eat. We're going to lunch. Even if it's on Zoom, we eat together. It was a standing meeting. And then for I had board champions. And those board champions were the people who had my back in a board meeting. If I've never, if we never had um, board giving before, and it was something new that I was introducing to the organization, I didn't introduce it. My board champion did. And that board champion was someone on the board that everybody respected. And they were the ones who saying, we need to do this. This is the best practice. And I went to lunch with them on a weekly basis. Now my other board members, at least once a year, I would pop by their office or once a quarter, once a year, some once a quarter, some once a year, but I would pop by their office and I would check in on them and I would talk about what's going on. 
and talk about some of the challenges and see what goals they had and see, you know, just to connect with them. It's about building a relationship with them. And as you're building that relationship with them, you're teaching them how to build relationships with the donors. And so keep that in mind. So be an advocate. Share their personal story. You want them to uh, be able to share why they uh, join this board, why they're giving time to this board. Um, spend time. You want them to spend time in the nonprofit. You want to have an elevator speech. So how do you give them stories to share? How do you um, make time they spend, make sure they spend time in the nonprofit? This is where it's strategy, right? You start your meetings off with mission uh, moments. And so I saw someone here was with Boys and Girls Club. I spent 20 years in Boys and Girls Club. So I would kick off my board meetings with the kids coming into the boardroom. And they would say what their name is, what school they go to, why they come to the club. And then the board members would ask questions like, what's your favorite part about being here? Or what's your least favorite part about being here? And they would tell the truth and they would share the stories. And that would be stories that my board members retain because they won't retain members, but they'll retain that little floor came to the meeting and this is what he said. And they'll go out and share that story. Same thing with the uh, um, historical museum board that I serve on. You think, well, how do you tell stories with that? Our CEO highlights a historical moment every time he speaks at our board meeting. And when you walk into the board room, they have a, exhibits around. And we have 15 minutes where we can walk those exhibits. There was a zoo board. Guess what they did? They bought in a snake to the meeting. And what do you think everybody was talking about at the Rotary Club meeting, at the chamber meeting, at the this, the meeting? They were talking about their opportunity for them to be in the same room and touch a snake and dispelling myths that they may have about snakes. Look, I still got those same um, feelings about snakes. That It didn't change my feelings, but there was conversations to be had. They and spend time in the nonprofit. How do you get your board members to spend time in the nonprofit? Well, you have a calendar and not the overwhelming calendar. The calendar that says, here's when all our board meetings are, here are when we're having events that we want board engagement. So there was like three events that we wanted board engagement at those events to interact with the kids and our families. One was at Halloween, one was at Thanksgiving, and one was at Christmas. And that was what was on the board calendar. And it was, we had one board member that greeted all the parents. And, I'm, and when I say greeted, there was thousands. It was open to the community. We fed over 600 people for Thanksgiving. I had board members come in and serve the dinners. You have to be very intentional about what you want them to do and give it to them in writing on a calendar. And then with the elevator speech, you take some time in your board retreat, hopefully you're having a retreat, and you develop that elevator speech so that you're all speaking the same language when you're going out and talking about the organization. But to get them to participate in resource development and fundraising, that is the dirty F word. Mm. Can I just jump in real quick? I'm sorry, Sabrina. I get hot about this topic. But I just love the boards. But one thing, when you guys think about who your superstar volunteers are or like who your top donors are, right? A lot of them are contributing and getting involved because they're connected to the cause, right? And a lot of times, why don't we apply that same principle to our board? A lot of times the board for us is just like a shiny trophy or a, a shiny decoration. And we just put it on the shelf and we say, here are all the names on our board, but they have like no idea what you actually do, right? And I, have, I, I want you to ask yourself after this call, what is the intention of my board? Is it a show? Or is it to actually make a change, right? Is it just a display? Or is it actually to make a difference, 
right? Do you want to have a real community or do you want to just collect the coins from them? Because that is what's going to determine what the longevity and the impact of your board is going to be. So when Sabrina is saying, have them actually get connected to the cause, when you see Cindy saying, oh, I actually have the youth come and speak to my board, when you actually, what I used to do is my people used to also volunteer on the fields with the kids, right? Because guess what? There is no hierarchy here. There is not, we are better than you. There is no, I am the savior and I have a savior complex. There's no us versus them. It's we, and we are coming together to make an impact and a difference. And that is how you're going to have longevity. And that is how you're going to have an invested board. Okay. Let Amen, my Let friend. Amen. Okay? <laughs> that is exactly what this is about because you have to build that relationship. You have to get them in front of the mission. You they are not a necessary evil. And that's how a lot of people approach their board. They're part of your team. And so embrace them as teams. I often think that board members are the most overlooked volunteers. They're volunteering again, their time, their talent, and their treasure. How, when's the last time you sent your board member a thank you note? When's the last time you recognized them? And, but again, Let's talk about this participating resource development and fundraising. That's the dirty F word. You want to know the magic around that. So when board members, what board members are telling themselves about fundraising is they're telling themselves that um, I don't like to hear no. I'm uncomfortable with asking for money. I don't like asking my friends or strangers for money. I don't know any rich people. Um, they feel like they're going to be begging. All of these things go through their mind when you start talking about fundraising and um, securing those resources, right? This is, this is natural. This is what's going through their minds, right? Let's take our nonprofit industry as a whole. Here's the deal. A lot of people make assumptions about nonprofits. So your board members are making some of those same assumptions about the nonprofit industry. Some people really think that nonprofits can't make money. Some people really think that um, nonprofits, don't they get all their money from the government? Can't we write a grant for that? You have to understand, you have to dismantle those assumptions that we're all walking around with. And I say we all are walking around with because there's still some people in the nonprofit industry themselves that feel that way. I've been married for 30 years, right? 30 years. I know I don't look that, that old. Thank you. Um, but my husband, after being in this industry for, for 20 of those 30 years, still say, uh, can't, can't you get a grant for that? Or don't the government fund that? And I'm like, no. It is the board of directors. It is a collective because that's who oversees fundraising. But it takes a team and everybody has a role to play on the team. The CEO is the visionary and they're the public face of the organization. The board members bring credibility and they bring the relationships. That's why it's so important important who you get on your board and who, once you get them how do you activate them that's why if you have your mother brother cousin on the board it's not advancing because they know the same people you know the whole point is to get board members from different areas in the community different work relationships and allow them to bring that credibility and that relationship to your organization. And then the development director helps coordinate all the moving parts. Now, 20 years in my organization, I didn't have a development director, except for the last five years. And I'm gonna tell y'all right now, I ran the first two off because I didn't know what to do with them because I was a CEO and I have, I was used to doing the role of the development director as well. And, and it wasn't, not, I wasn't nice to them. And I have called uh, to this day and apologized because I didn't understand their role, but everybody has a role to play. And one person cannot and should not be expected to play all of those distinct roles. 
when it comes to your board members, they are your force multipliers. CEOs, development directors, you can't be everywhere all the time. You can't be at every event. You can't recognize, you can't represent the organization at every event. You don't have the time. You don't have the energy. That's where burnout results. So you have to utilize your board members and allow them to play their role. They should be people that are well regarded in the community. They are your ambassadors and they're giving their time, their talent, and their treasure. And because they're giving that, they're demonstrating to the public and to the community that your organization is vital and deserves the community support. So successful fundraising is about building relationships based on trust. And the board exists in large part to bring and build those relationships. So I can hear it already, but let me get you into the mindset of the board because nobody joined your board and they said to themselves, this is a great opportunity to fundraise. Nobody did. When you get them on your board, you have that clear recruitment process where you are talking about fundraising, but not only that, there is training that's involved in that. If you don't, what you're going to get is that board member who has all of these assumptions, you're not dismantling those assumptions, and you think by keep asking them to solicit their list that that's going to work. It's not. It's not strategic, and it doesn't motivate your board members or increase their willingness to get involved and to be involved. So you have to change your mindset around educating your board members and developing a strategic plan for their involvement. Why is that? Because not all board members are created equal as if, and not all people have the same strengths when it comes to fundraising. But this is where I hope you embrace this. I sat in that seat um, with you as a CEO for a number of years and I was overwhelmed and I was stressed out. Let me just be honest, overwhelmed and stressed out on a number of days. And when I first took over from a CEO who had been there for 30 years, Right. I remember going into the board meetings and and she did all the talking and kind of reported back everything. And the board members rarely said anything. And then the meeting was over. That was it. But the one and for and she was good at her job because the organization grew. But the tip that she gave me or the one thing that she reinforced with me to be successful as a CEO of a nonprofit. There's two things that you have to do. You have to take care of the board and you have to take care of the money. So that information coupled with all the other trainings and learnings that I did that said, hey, your board needs to be engaged. Your board needs to be this. Your board needs to be that. But what I saw was board members who just showed up for that month and the CEO talking and that's what I saw. That's what I knew. That's what I saw. But I learned these best practices. So when I took over, um, I knew I wanted to change. And so for me, I'm a formulas girl. And if I'm taking care of the board and I'm taking care of the money and I don't want to be overwhelmed and I don't want to be stressed out, what do I need to do? So I'm a formulas girl. And that's where the fundraising process um, formula kind of came to life. So let's talk about it. And I really want to take some time to talk about this. So fundraising, 10% of fundraising is identifying. That means identifying potential donors. That means um, going to those uh, events and collecting those brochures and seeing who gave to that organization. That's what that is, identifying. That means maybe sitting around your board member, meet, boardroom and asking your board members who they know. That's identifying. That's 10%. 
The other 10% of fundraising is qualifying. Okay, just because they gave to this organization does not mean that they're going to give to your organization. Are they passionate about kids? Are they passionate about animals? Are they passionate about the environment? Okay, once you have that, then you have your list of qualified people that you can cultivate. And 60% of fundraising is cultivation. And so for me, I leaned into that because it made sense. If 60% of fundraising is cultivation, let me lean into that with my board members. And then 5% of fundraising is asking for money. That is what people hear when you say fundraising. That is what people hear when they when you say, will you join my board? I call that the fear of the five. But let me tell you, if you do cultivation right, checks will come. I know that's hard to believe. And I know I've, I've said this before and I've seen people rolling their eyes. It works. I've received checks in the mail at $30,000 or more because we cultivated the relationship right. And we hadn't even got to the ask yet because we built that relationship. We laid what was going on in the organization. Um, they understood what was happening. We learned about that donor. That's where the real relationship is. And then 15% of fundraising is saying thank you. Now you might be saying, well, what does this got to do with my board? Well, this is the deal. Your board can shine in any of these areas and it's not just about asking for money. Out of a board of 21, I had three people who were not afraid of asking for money. And I was okay with that because I leaned into cultivation and we were strategic in that. My board members leaned into their strengths and I had to identify and give them a choice. So you don't wanna ask for money, that's fine. What is your strength? Now, some participation is non-negotiable. 100% of your board members should, should be making a personal gift. That's not negotiable. But you need to understand the fundraising process and offer a range of various options to your board members. And one that plays into their strengths. Are they a door opener? So board members can participate in fundraising process by opening the door to the eventual ask. Let me share a story around this. And this is one of my favorite stories to share. One of my board members, her name was Millie Smith, and she worked in the back office of the bank. She was in BSA. This is the person that is fraud um, and compliance and all that. The employees don't like her, but the bank owners do because it keeps them out of trouble. Well, Millie, when she interviewed for our board, we talked about fundraising. And she said, well, I do not feel comfortable asking for money. And so at that point, if I didn't buy into this process, this formula, I would have been like, okay, well, you're not for our board because we, we need to, that's, we need money, right? But instead it was like, well, what are you willing to do? And her response was, I am willing to introduce you to anyone in my circle. Well, again, I just told you she worked in the BSA at the bank. So she introduced us to the bank owner. As a result of that, the bank um, owner and the uh, bank president became a part of our capital campaign and we raised $12 million. I got to fly in a private uh, plane to go visit a foundation and walked out with a $350,000 check. Not only that, if we did a board retreat, we used the bank boardroom. Um, if we wanted to disseminate information out to the community, uh, we you, we could do that through uh, through the bank itself. But it wasn't haphazard. As the door opener, this is what she did. She said, he eats at this restaurant for breakfast every day. So what do you think I happen to show up at least once a week? Not to um, solicit money, but to have that familiarity, to stop by the table and say, how are you doing today? Not only did she do that, 
She would stop by his office and say, this is what's happening at the club this week. She would give him updates. And so the millions of dollars that was raised, I credit at the Millie, who was the door opener to this gift. And she never asked for a dime. Now, for those that are Rotarians, I'm a Rotarian. I've been a Rotarian for over 20 years. I presented the story. And because of this story, she was honored with a Paul Harris fellow. So your door openers can be powerful. And then there's the cultivators. It's true what they say, people give to people. I'm still of that belief. And donors want to know, like, and trust where they give their money to. And so that's why cultivation is so important. It's about building a relationship. Cultivation is, is building a relationship before you ask for money. And so we were very strategic around that. Remember, I said if my board members didn't ask for money, I was okay with that. Um, we use a five by five cultivation plan. So each of my board members had five accounts. Yes, I use business terms in this nonprofit world because nonprofit is just a tax designation and it's not a business model. So minutes, my Sabrina. board- I don't want to cut you off for 10 minutes so we have, can get to some q &A. Okay. okay, I got you. I got you. So five by five plan. Each board member had five accounts. Um, that's people they were cultivating. And they, the goal was to touch them five times within that year. And so how do you touch them five times within in that year? Meetings. Meetings still reign king. Face-to-face, -face, taking them to breakfast, going to lunch, over Zoom, getting face-to-face. -face. And when you're face-to-face, -face, getting, getting those discovery questions. Why do they give? What inspired them to give? You know, what, what are they interested um, about? Um, phone calls. One of the best times that I use to cultivate is in the airport. When I am in the airport, I take out my phone and I start calling my five account. And I say, I was just thinking about you. I just wanted to check in. Phone calls, newsletters, getting them on your newsletter so that there's continual communication, whether you are sending that newsletter once a month, once a quarter, whatever it is, getting them on that newsletter and other communications like um, having them follow you on social media events and i'm not talking about special events i'm talking about house parties inviting them to parties uh, intimate gatherings inviting them on tours of your facility for my boys and girls club people the best thing i ever did to get people on a tour was not to ask them to come on the tour but to ask them to come speak to the kids and then um to give advice when they were 12 years old and then once they did that i had a kid take them on the tour of the facility because sometimes people won't just come in for a tour. So you got to get them in. You got to think creatively. Volunteer opportunities. Some people like hands-on volunteer opportunities. So invite them in. When we're serving the Thanksgiving dinners, we would invite our board members and potential board members to come in and serve those meals. So think about opportunities like that. And then surveys. Now, I am not a huge fan of formal surveys, but I am a fan of uh, seeking advice because once you, where you seek advice, money will soon follow. People feel value when you, when you ask them for their feedback. And so this is all a part of cultivation. And then the askers, that's the 5%. Board members can contribute. Remember, I only had three, but those who um, cultivated their five accounts, what we did was when it was time to set up that meeting and do the face-to-face -face ask, we would say, we'd love to come in and talk about how you can continue to support. The board members would come in, they'll do their little chitty chatter. And then I, as the CEO, would say, will you consider an investment of $10,000 in our organization? That That's where the sidekick um, term came from. And then thanker, 15% of fundraising is thanking, Okay thanking board members can play a huge part in maintaining those relationships building relationships cultivating stewardship thinkers maintaining their relationships 15 percent, 75 percent of fundraising is relationships so quick quick tip in every board meeting with board members writing thank you cards you pass out the script you give them the ink pens they do the cards. They don't make it out to anyone. They write the script, sign their name. You collect them, collect your pens too. Put them on your desk. When the gift comes in, 
add the donor's name, sign your name at the bottom, put it in the envelope and send it out. That is how you get your board members involved in that. You can even have a task force. And I had a task force of three because you got to know your board member strengths. That when a certain size gift came in, I would email them. This gift came in. This was the amount. Here's their cell phone number. Can you call them and thank them? And they would do that. So what board members need from staff so they can fundraise easily and effectively? If you want your board members involved in fundraising, you got to help them. You got to equip them. You got to provide them education and share client stories. You got to make it easy. You got to give board members scripts, social media posts, sample letters and emails. You got to be accountable, hold board members accountable for what they say they would do. And you have to be explicit. You have to let them know exactly what it is you want them to do. Exactly. If you want your board member to secure this, if it's about money and you want them to secure this donation, then you need to just say, I need you to, I know you have this relationship with this person. I need you to secure this donation. I did a survey and what CEOs and development directors top two things. They don't want to ruin relationships and they don't want to seem bossy. You're not going to ruin relationships. I told you, I serve on five boards. I need to be told explicitly what to do because I'm busy and don't make me guess. I don't want the guesswork. Just tell me what you need me to do. The seeming bossy, you are the boss. You're the CEO. You are the boss. This is a partnership, but you're the boss. Just tell them what you need. Trust me, having sat in the CEO seat, and now serving on five boards, that's what we need in order to be successful in that role. Don't put us in the corner and say, I don't want to deal with them. Bring us and tell us exactly what you want us to do. So, the, oh, one more thing before I stop sharing. Here's the deal. Some, I had someone say this to me. Well, board members should understand that we're busy as CEOs running this um, organization, so they should respond to our emails. They should have the courtesy to respond to the emails. And my response to that was, well, how is that working for you? Let me tell you this. Board members, there's strengths and there's ways of communication. If you send an email to me, I'm not reading your email. But if you send me a text and say, Hey, this, I'll respond to a text. Or if you say, hey, um, I sent you an email. I really need you to read it. I'll do it then. But if you're communicating with all your board members in the same way and just sending an email and you're getting upset because no one is responding, then the part of the problem is you. And remember, I said, this is about comfort zone. So text, what, how do they prefer to be communicated with? So good. Is it text? Is it WhatsApp? This is my contact information. Lord, I got the cue. This is my real cell phone. If you call, it's going to go to voicemail. Um, But you leave me a message and I will call you back. So I'm going to stop share right now. There you go. First of all, can we give a round of applause to the amazing Sabrina? Because what? That was, we got some facts, y'all. We got some facts. That was so good and y'all there is more where that came from i know we only have a few minutes left um so i actually was able to boil down these questions into like a few main questions and we're going to just jump right in talk about culture change you got a board that don't want to fundraise they're like but we don't do all that the board president don't do all that how do we start to actually make that change in culture and start shifting them into this mindset um, I, for me, I think that I always use retreats for when I wanted to do some major change, right? Mm -hmm. So I use retreats and I always bought in an outside consultant because mm -hmm. as a CEO, you can say the same thing over and over again. And it's just like, you know, it's just like with, with your kids, your parents can tell you something and it ain't cool. And then somebody else says the same thing I and mean, it's cool. So I started that and then identifying a board champion is key. And not only identifying them, but, you know, if you're recruiting a board champion on, you tell them especially, why am I recruiting you on this board? I mm. need you to be the champion of this change. Mm. 
So that and, be the uh, I would say board limits, y'all. Board terms and board yeah. limits. Don't just say happily ever after. We ain't doing all that in 2024, okay? Board, <laughs> and also, you want to keep your organization fresh, right? So having board terms and having board limits. Okay, I try to, okay, um, embracing diversity and income levels and race. Mm -hmm. Like, not everyone can give a $10,000 give get. Exactly. Um, talk to us about that. How do you continue and to make sure it's inclusive? Oh, yes, exactly. So- Here's the deal. I do believe that every board member should give. And I don't like, I don't want to say, wait. well, I don't know how to say it. We got, we're in a time crunch. I'm like, wasting the energy around, well, how much is the minimum? How much is that? And that's why I appreciate when, when a society is created and you say board members join this society. Now that society can start off at $50 all the way up to $10,000, whatever that is. And then in your bylaws, so what we deal with the museum, in our bylaws, we can say the executive committee can um, waive the requirement um, to join the society, but it's based on that individual's board member's performance. So if they're knocking it out of the park with time and talent, then the executive committee can very well waive that. Now, we like to do that in a limited capacity, but those are the options that hundred percent. And I also do st still think that a hundred percent giving capacity is important because if you aren't at a position to give, are you in a position to serve, right? right. Like, do you have a position to serve? And that's why I also love the give get mentality as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's important. Okay. Where do you source board members? That was another common question that I saw. Um, I say um, you got to source board members through networking, mm -hmm. rotaries, chambers, mixers. I'm always looking for board members. I am, I, in my chambers, I've done all the leadership classes. I found some of my best board members there. I found some of my best board members in Rotary. I, I You just got to get out in the community. And mm -hmm. one of the things I do is a board um, recruitment challenge. And what it literally boils down to a lot of time is people's network or CEOs or whoever's doing the recruitment, their network is small. And so in order to increase your potential pool of people to choose from, you got to get out there and you got to network. Mm -hmm. Open that up. I love it. And then the last question, ongoing resources for board members, definitely watch Uncharitable. If they haven't seen the movie Uncharitable, oh, yes. send them this recording and all the things that Sabrina Walker Hernandez does, okay, because she's on it. But any other ongoing resources for board members they can that they can pass on? Um, yeah, I would say the, the webinars that you guys do are great as well. Um, there's also, um, uh, board pro, uh, with the uh, crystal cherry. Um, mm -hmm. so all there's some great information out there. And I just read a post today, even like board source are changing their tone and their language around mm -hmm. this. So mm -hmm. it, it's going to be interesting to see, um, what comes out of that. Because they're 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 in right now in the process of doing their theory of change, you know. Mm -hmm. Because like Floyd said, uncharitable. Everybody is questioning this and looking at this and examining this, and and so things are changing, and yeah. this is a good thing. I love it. Thank you, Sabrina. Y'all flood those comments with thank yous to Sabrina. That was amazing stuff, y'all. I am. This was just amazing okay i got all my notes y'all know me i've been learning too okay next month you're going to be joined by my amazing friend lynn wester on the 10 top ways to effectively acknowledge your donors and y'all you know what i always say but if you haven't heard it today i am so grateful for you i love spending time with you and i am rooting for you and i love you keep on shining and taking your board to the next level okay